Awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I am Rachel Jones Ross. I am from Calgary, Alberta. I'm a landscape and astrophotographer. And um, uh, Calgary is right near the Rocky Mountains, if you guys are all familiar with that. So when I was asked to give a presentation today, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. So Sony said, um, just talk about something that you're passionate about. Thank you. So this word passion, we use it a lot and maybe it's become a little bit cliche, but do you know the etymology of the word passion? It actually has Latin origins and it means to suffer, which I think is wildly, in, wildly appropriate for landscape photography. And also, it's a really beautiful thing if you think about it, because we're most willing to suffer for the things that we're most passionate about. So today I thought I would talk to you a little bit about my passion in night photography and also um, share with you some of the, the ways that I think that we can create compelling night images. Okay, so the first thing I would tell anybody interested in night photography is to explore the beauty in your own backyard. Um, and I know what you're going to say. That's really easy for you because you live right next to the Rocky Mountains. And it's true. I am very fortunate to live and create where I do. But a lot of photographers in my area might choose not to shoot a location like this because it's so popular. But I love this lake. This is one of my very favorite places. Um, it was a place that I went to, to um, when I was first learning night photography. I'd go here to practice. And now it's one of my favorite places to teach at. And I think the more time you spend at a location, the more intimate your knowledge of that location becomes. And, um, and that helps you to create something compelling. So I'll tell you two things I learned about this location. The first thing that I learned is that the light here is magic. It's really, really unique. Because the light from the town of Banff, it reflects off those mountains and it creates this beautiful otherworldly glow, this sort of ethereal look that I think adds a certain amount of magic. And the second, perhaps more important thing that I learned about this location is that it's full of leeches. So I learned this the hard way when I was doing a, an engagement shoot. Um, I had a couple standing out on the edge of the dock and, um, and the best place for me was to be in the water facing them. And I shot for about 45 minutes. And when I came out, ready for a break, ready for everybody to get warm, I had four leeches stuck to my ankles, which is, I can't tell you how distressing that is for a person who's got a severe worm phobia. Um, so luckily, my clients were very, very kind. And uh, on their break, they ran to the store and got me some cling film, you know, the saran wrap, so I could wrap my ankles up protect me from the leeches. So I went back in the water, which is even more distressing than coming out with four leeches on me. And um, I managed to finish the shoot. And when I did get out, I still had two leeches. Um, so knowing a location and really experiencing it is really invaluable for helping you to create compelling night images. So the next thing I would tell you, if you're interested in night photography, would be to shoot what you love. Now there's a lot of things I love about this image, but my favorite thing is that this is a picture of my daughter. This is my daughter, Brooke. And last March, she fell and she shattered her ankle. Um, the road to recovery has been very long for her. Um, and at this point, at this day, on this adventure, she had been four months post-recovery and she was really nervous about getting out and being on her ankle. So we had to traverse a, a long stretch of beach that had really round rocks in it. And for her, this was a huge accomplishment. It was like, it, it helped her to know that she was going to get better. So this was a big night for us. And there, you can't see it, but on the other side of this waterfall is a rope swing. And we sat there during sunset and just laughed and giggled and pushed each other on the swing and had a really great time. So the memory of this night is a really beautiful night for me. And also, if you haven't gathered already, I do love creating night images. So having the Milky Way here with my daughter, it's something that I really love. The editing for this image, though, was next level. So um, you wouldn't know by looking at it, but this is a composite of 28 images. 
So I started by shooting the shooting Brooke actually during blue hour when the light was still enough that I could get a nice clear shot of her with a nice fast shutter. But at the same time, I wanted um, I wanted there to not be any sort of uh, directional light from the sun. So I waited until blue hour, and then we shot together after blue hour. But this is a blue hour image. And then, because I took an image of her that was really fast, a fast shutter, and nice and crisp, the water didn't look that smooth and, and beautiful. So I had to do a long exposure for the waterfall. And then, to get the Milky Way to really pop, I was trying a new technique of, of um, stacking images. So I took short, short exposures so that my stars didn't trail, and then really high ISOs, and I stacked 25 images in a, in a software to get that nice crisp look of the Milky Way. And then I had to begin the process of blending them all together, which was an arduous task. So going back to the idea of shooting what you love, I spent 20 hours editing this image. And if you, if you know me or if you've met me before, you'll know that I don't let a project go until it's done. So I didn't really eat, and I was not really taking care of myself. And 20 hours into this editing process, I finally send the image to my daughter, and I'm so proud of it. And she takes a look at it, and she's like, I don't know, the colors are all wrong, and I don't like the shadows on my face, and whatever. And I was just like, oh, come on. So I went back to editing, and two hours later, I finally had an image that we both loved. And so looking back at it, you know, being able to shoot something you love, it really takes some of the sting out of the, the more complicated aspects of either editing or the sting out of staying up all night and being sleep deprived or being cold or whatever the case may be. So shoot what you love. Another thing that I would suggest would be to shoot for the scene. So in an image like this, it's really hard to get the full image in a single shot. So the reason being is that if I were to do an exposure that's long enough for the foreground, my stars are going to start to trail. Um, and the light of that lodge is actually really, really bright. So it makes it difficult to get an image from top to bottom where everything has the right exposure and where everything has the right focus. So you wouldn't know it by looking at this, but that night to get this image, it was minus 30, which is Celsius, uh, which is beautiful, beautiful uh, conditions. When it gets that cold, you get mist coming up off the water like you see here. and. Um, and you get frost flowers. And you get things that you wouldn't normally otherwise see when the temperatures are a little bit warmer. So I'm laying on my belly on a snowbank in minus 30. And um, my camera and tripod are perched on that little shelf of ice that you see in the, very, in, the, in the very foreground. But it's only about a quarter of an inch thick, and it's floating. So every time I go to take a picture and I press the shutter, my camera and my foreground start floating away from me, and I have to bring it back. So um, it was a really challenging shoot to do in the first place. But because my camera was so low to the ground, I really needed to focus stack that image and take a shot that was focused on the foreground and then another one that was focused on the stars. And related to being cold, um, this was taken on my A7S. And as uh, many of you probably know, the A7S had a really uh, difficult time in the cold with battery life. So now I'm shooting on the A7R3 and the A9 most recently, um, and the battery life is amazing. So um, dealing with cold weather like this or really cold conditions like we get in the Rockies uh, is so much easier on the A7R3. So shoot for the scene. This is another example of shooting for the scene. Again, it's something that I had to focus stack because I was very close to the foreground element. And also, um, if I had a long enough exposure for the foreground, then my stars would begin to trail. So the longer I'm going to leave the shutter open, the, the, the more those stars are going to look like streaks across the sky rather than little dots. So the next tip I would give would be to use ambient light to your advantage. So when I refer to ambient light, I'm talking about moonlight, maybe the aurora, maybe starlight. Um, or maybe even a little bit of light pollution. I know as photographers, we, anybody who's done astro, you want to stay away from light pollution. You want to stay away from anything that, that washes out the stars. But a little bit of light pollution, as you saw in my earlier slides, can be a really interesting element in your, in your exposure. So um, 
when I teach photography, one of the things that I notice my students do most of all is they will show up at a location and they'll be wildly excited and they just want to they just want to get the shot. So they show up and they plop their tripod down and they start taking pictures right away. And what I encourage people to do is to take their camera off their tripod and start moving around. Get low, move left, move right, find a composition that you really love before you start committing to faffing around with a tripod. Um, and it, that, so that's one way to think about changing your perspective on a scene. Another way to think about changing your perspective is to think about how you view the scene or how you see it. So this is one of my favorite locations in the Rockies. And it's only accessible like this. You only get this view in the winter months. And to get it, you have to stand on a frozen river beneath a frozen waterfall. And you can hear these eerie but exhilarating sounds of the water rushing beneath you. So I've spent many hours here just laying on my back on this frozen river and staring up at the sky. And I can my, let my imagination take myself back to a time when the starlight filtered through the cracks and these formations were first forged by the, the rushing water of the Kicking Horse River. It's in moments like these, when I let my imagination go, that I really can put myself in a place to create something unique. So I encourage you in your photography to just change your perspective. Um, having a flexible plan. Anybody who's done any kind of landscape photography knows that there's the dream shot and then there's the shot you usually get. So um, this is my favorite example of where things go awry when it comes to planning a shot. Last winter, we had the most amazing and cold winter in the Canadian Rockies, but no snow. So the lakes all froze and we were all out ice skating and having a wonderful time. And another thing that happens when there's no snow and the lakes freeze is that you get to see really unusual ice formations like frozen methane bubbles. So I had seen that these frozen methane bubbles had happened to form on my favorite lake, the one that I showed you in the very beginning. And I wanted to get out there and photograph this really unusual phenomenon. So I set off on my own. I was by myself. And um, I was in search of these bubbles. And I walked all the way across the lake and back. For an hour, I couldn't find them. And finally, I thought, well, I'll just walk up along the lake shore until I find an area that kind of looks like maybe it resembles the area that I had in mind, you know, th the view. And then I fell through the ice. And I got stuck in muskeg. So for any of you who don't know what muskeg is, it's kind of like quicksand. So I went in to about the top of my thigh. I had this leg was free, this leg was stuck in the muskeg. And at first I thought, this is like, I treated it like an inconvenience, you know? I was stuck in the, in the muskeg, it stinks like sulfur, and it's wet, and it's cold outside, so nobody wants to be wet and cold. But I took my backpack off, really wanted to protect the Sony gear. If I was going to fall in with two legs, I, the last thing I wanted was to go in with my backpack full of gear on. So I take my backpack off and I push it to the side, and then I work at trying to get out of this hole. I couldn't get out. So five minutes, five minutes goes by, and my sort of like annoyance turned into like a little bit of anxiety. Ten minutes goes by, and anxiety is turning into a little bit of panic. 15 minutes goes by and I'm in a full panic. I cannot get out of this hole and I'm by myself. So 20 minutes goes by and I'm pretty sure that my uh, logical brain just completely shut down and I was running on pure emotions. And for some reason I thought to grab my phone. And there is no reason why my phone should have worked at this location. It never works, there's never cell service there. But I was lucky and it did work. I must have been in the one square meter of space where it did work. And I was able to get a call out. <laughs> and the person that I called is my son, who happens to be one of the smartest people I know. And he said, what you need to do is you need to spread your body weight out evenly on the ice. And so for the first time, I thought about laying forward, which was terrifying because that's the deeper part of the lake. And if I was going to go in, and I could already hear the ice kind of like crackling and creaking under the other side of me. So if I was going to fall in, I didn't want to be falling in head first, but this is the only position that I hadn't tried. So I laid the full front of my body down on the ice and put my arms out to the side. And when I did that, I felt this tiny, tiny little gap open up behind my leg. 
And I knew at that moment that I could get out. And I struggled and I strained and I pulled muscles down the left side of my body. I worked so hard to get out of the hole, but I did get out of the hole, minus a winter boot. So I hobbled back to the car, minus one winter boot, and I was so um, <sighs> disenchanted. I was so just um, let down that I didn't get the shot that I had set out to get that night. But at least I was safe. So two days later, I went back for my redemption shot and here the ice had completely melted. My ice bubbles were gone, and this is the shot that I got. I still love it, it was a fantastic memory, and I have yet to get my, my perfect image of my frozen methane bubbles on my favorite lake, but maybe this winter I'll get that shot before falling through. So the last point I would say would be to, to um, be creative and to collaborate. So I've been really fortunate to work with some really, really amazing people over the last year. I've worked with students and I've worked with my Sony Alpha family in the collective to create images. And I think that through collaboration, I've grown more as an artist than I have in the last however many years since I started. So if I could give anybody here one piece of advice to walk away with, it would be to, to collaborate with others and be creative, feed off of each other, and, um, and find new ways to explore any type of imagery that you're pursuing. Thank you very much.